At any cost, Mets 1870. This is a game published by GMT and designed by Hermann Lutman, a fairly prolific war game designer that has given us some really fine games um, based sometimes on historical topics and sometimes on sci-fi, especially often with a sort of like B-movie sensibility. As for historical designs, uh, Lotman had already published in the past a game about the Franco-Prussian War, which clearly is the topic of this game here. The game was called the Mars Latour, and I, and I reviewed it when it was published a couple of years ago, uh, published by Victory Point Games. And it was a very interesting design with a lot of randomness, cheat pool game, and cheat pool is a mechanic that I like very much in war gaming. It was a triple game with a lot of random events and other randomness um, built in to represent the difference in command. The problem of, of war game in the Franco-Russian War is, among other things, uh, the difference in command. The French being very often indecisive and inefficient, as opposed to the Prussians being so driven, uh, so aggressive and also uh, so well trained and simply very capable. So it's difficult to simulate that unless you force a French player to simply act uh, I would say like you know the stupid rules but that's pretty much uh, what it may boil down to unless you use chit pulls then simply based on the on the combination of different chits the number the quality and what the chits uh, tell you to do then you can by manipulating again the composition of chits that go in the in the cup you may uh, simulate all of these things. Uh, the French may be hit by events that make um, make their troops uh, more difficult to control. So the French play is still playing at the best of their possibilities. And also you have uh, the chits that may allow the Prussian play to activate more often, to activate better, to do more things, to recover, uh, to recover, to rally more effectively, and so on and so forth. That is what we had in Mars Latour, and I took my time to to cover it here because it applies to at any cost Mets 1872. Basically, this game is based on the same system. Uh, it seems it's, it seems more complex to me, if I remember correctly. It seems to me that there are more layers, um, more elements here to take into account. That the game is more advanced, but if you play the game, you can recognize the similarities. So at any cost, Mets 1870. Without further ado, let's take a closer look at this design. This is the map for the game. It is printed on paper. It is the only map that you have. It is single. It is single-sided, but it has a lot of stuff going on. It is more than sufficient to, um, to give us a lot of variety, a lot of interesting situations revolving around the two battles in the game, and those two battles are the object of multiple scenarios that simply look at the event from different perspectives at different distances, from small scenarios to uh, a large scenario that shows the entire battle to campaign scenarios. As for the battles, we have Marla Tour that will happen kind of like around here with the French units waiting. No one knows what exactly, but they just sit there confused looking and they try to activate as small groups of Prussians arrive and attack them from different directions. And the, the, don't look at these units. Well, you can look at them. They look neat, but this is just, I just play some units randomly there to explain how the game works and we'll talk about those in a minute. The other battle is Gravelos and Priva, and it happens around here with the French units placed in a line of defense, they have entrenchments, they are in a strong position, again they have trouble activating, and the Prussians that are much more efficient are coming from different directions in strong columns. The biggest problem in that scenario, in the situation for the Prussians, is going to be the entrenchments that make the the French defenders very strong and traffic congestion because if you have a forced that ravine what a pain in the neck to to cross or to maneuver around and of course you can maneuver much faster if you're using roads but they can get clogged pretty pretty fast now let's take a closer look and see how the game works this is a chit pull game, which means that you will need an opaque container, and in this container you will place event chits and activation chits. 
uh, the scenario instructions will tell you exactly how many and which ones to use. Command events, uh, there is a number of different events, uh, some uh, need to be resolved as soon as they are drawn, some may be kept by a player and used uh, the specific time and uh, there is a player aid that tells you what they do, don't worry. At the beginning of each turn, each player selects one of their command events secretly and dumps it in there. Then the scenario instructions will also tell you how many other command events need to be randomly drawn, so the, the owning player, well, no player really knows what they're gonna be, and suppose that these are what the instructions tell us to place in there. Then uh, we also have military commands, cheats that represent different uh, military groups in the game and again the scenario instructions will tell us which groups are active in each army and the groups that are active get their cheats placed in there. We also have a commander-in-chief, commander-in-chief cheats for the two sides, these will activate special uh, situations and procedures. We have the Fortunes of War cheat, which adds yet more random stuff. It may enhance the next cheat, it may degrade it, or it may actually trigger other other situations. So then we mix them up and then we start drawing to see what happens in the turn. Again, it may be special activations, it may be command events, but you know, the heart of the game is when you draw is when you draw a command sheet, in which case you activate the corresponding group, the group corresponding to the command that was just randomly selected from the cup. Let's suppose, for example, that the chit for this guy was selected. Now we're going to activate the corresponding commander. Each commander has a double-sided uh, a counter, one representing the stats a commander has when in a defensive position and one when in an aggressive posture. These two numbers that you see here are range and, and movement points. As you can see, the range changes depending on the posture. So first, when we activate a commander, we choose if he's going to be aggressive or defensive. And then we check the range. Not all hexes are the same in terms of range. Landscape does matter. Range is degraded depending on the terrain. And a unit is in command if within that range from the commander or adjacent to a unit that is that is in command. Units that are out of command, there's a very interesting situation. For example, suppose that, that one there is out of command. You have a pool of out of command sheets that are not all the same. You draw one of these randomly for each unit that is out of command and you place the out of command sheets there. For now the unit doesn't do anything but then later in the turn it will activate and to know what it does you will flip the uh, out of command chit that he got. As you can see there are different things that may happen. There's a player aid for that to tell you what they do. And so uh, you do not know exactly what that is going to do. And then you activate the chit and choose the behavior within the limits of what the auto command chit tells you. This is very fun. In other games uh, being out of command can be a little gamey. You know exactly how the unit is going to act. Here you have a little bit more of randomness. Back to the commander, as for the defensive and aggressive, the main difference is that when in defense, uh, when defensive, the units under that commander may use a uh, road, uh, road bonus when moving on a road, they may build the fortifications, they may rally, they may still fire against the opponents, but they may not engage, they may not assault the opponent, and when in aggressive uh, state, the opposite is true. Now, after we check uh, our, our range, it is time finally to start using our units. First thing that the units can do is to fire. Actually, looking at the units, uh, the numbers that you see there are the strength, then we have movement, and then the number in a color background is the cohesion. And they're they placed on infantry, they're placed in the different positions, but it's still the same numbers. For cavalry, again, we have the same numbers, but we also have a background behind the strength points that indicates the weight, the power of impact of the cavalry, because we may have light, medium, or heavy. 
So first thing, we can fire the units that fire, check the range to their target, check to see if they have a line of sight, and if they are within range and they have line of sight, they can finally fire. All right, we have a player aid here that we use to determine uh, what's gonna happen. A couple of things we need to take into account. Range, we need to see if it's canister, effective, or extended. As you can see, the Prussians have have rifles used by the infantry that have worse range than their French counterparts, but they have better artillery because the extended range for Prussian artillery starts at 5x as opposed to the French artillery starts at 4. However, the French have the mitrailleuse, the coffee grinder, this nasty little piece of artillery that can just shower uh, the enemies with bullets and, and it's very, very painful. Once we have determined the range that we are at, we see if we have to adjust the strength combat of the unit that is firing. A canister, we get um, we that extra 150% of the strength points. At extended range, we get half of the strength points of the firing unit. Ineffective, nothing, nothing happens. So once we have the the actual the actual strength points. Uh, amount of shampoo that, is, that are firing, we look at the corresponding column here and then we start to modify. We modify that based on circumstances that have to do with the firing unit and or with the target terrain of the target, other things. Uh, who is firing with what technology? Again, the mitrailleuse may not have a great range, but it's intense. Special artillery is always reliable. Uh, there may be bad rolls that cause you uh, to work with duration, ammo, or skill and sight, all of these things. So finally, we get to see what the right column is. And when we find the right color, we roll two 10 sided dice a color one and a white one. The color one is used to actually determine the line of the column that we will use, the white one is used for morale tests. So we cross-reference the column that we are using with the result of the color die and we have the result which may be no effect, moral test, uh, modify moral test, uh, these pluses, hey pluses, no pluses are bad here, they make your moral test tougher, or, or um, casualty hits. There are basically two ways in which your units may be weakened, one is uh, by casualties and the other one is by morale. A unit starts fresh on this side here, when it takes a casualty hit, it is battle-worn, you flip it to this other side, which has worse stats, and if it takes another casualty hit, it has to take a break test. It may break, that is, it may leave the battlefield, it may be rebuilt later, but for now it is nowhere to be seen. Morale, failing a morale test, will turn a, a well-organized unit into a shaken one, with, uh, with lower stats, they are lowered by one. A shaken unit that takes a morale hit is now disrupted, so with even worse penalties on their basic stats. A disrupted unit that takes another morale test, well, you convert the morale test into a casualty test, uh, into a casualty hit. And therefore, well, you see, we follow the procedure that we showed earlier. So this is how you resolve combat. You're trying to demoralize and later uh, to uh, possibly convince your opponents to lead the battlefield. But the main role of, of fire, especially for infantry fire, is really to demoralize, to shake your opponents before you, boom, engage them into close combat. Ooh, teleporting. Yay, we like that. Before you engage them in close combat. And, and that's how, how it's done. Close combat, of course, assault. You need to be adjacent, adjacent to an enemy unit. You can pile up, you can pile up your own units against a, an ex that you're assaulting. But uh, once you, after you do that, you will need to choose a single hex as the lead ex for the assault. Once you have set up the situation, when you're resolving the assault, you look at this player right here. Very well done, but also very intense. A lot of information here. And a strange and unusual uh, idea that you have here is that you use both assault differential and the combat odds. Usually it's one or the other combat odds being fa favored back in the day. Differential feeling to me a little more modern. Hey, why choose when you can have both? 
So first you calculate the salt differential between the strength points of the units that are salting in the lead hex and the units that are defending and it can be any of these. Then you start looking for uh, modifications, uh, actually there may also modi be modifiers, modifications to the actual number of strength points. For example, if the artillery of the mitrailleuse is engaging assault, it is not as effective and other bonuses here, charging, info, charging cavalry of course is particularly good in assault. So once you have the differential, again based only on the defenders and the lead X, you then calculate the modifiers. The first modifier is based on the ratio, the combat odds, between the totality of the strength points that are attacking from all hexes that are attacking and the defenders. So you, you divide the total attacking force uh, uh, strength points by the strength points of the defender, you see the odds and the odds will give you a um, a, a shift or a shift in the column. Then you may have to shift the column more based again on things that you imagine. Infantry being in town, basically being terrain, depending on the terrain of the defender. Other things such as the pressure on infantry being well trained and with high morale. They're very, they're more effective in close combat, but they need to get close to the opponent because actually I forgot to mention that when you move adjacent to an opponent, the opponent may take basically with this um, reactive fire or opportunity fire. So once you have once you have the whole thing, once you have the exact column, again you roll cross-reference and then you apply the result which is and results are explained here. As you can see uh, there may be losses, uh, there may be retreats, uh, there may be just a casualty hits, tough fight which requires another role to determine exactly what it means. And then I mentioned the break test, I don't know, there's no need for, I believe, to get into the details of how you pass a morale test. Suffice to say that again you roll these two dice during a fire and the moral test use this die and you compare it to the tactical cohesion of the unit. I guess I kind of explained that. As for then after an assault uh, we get tough hits and again when we had the break test we use this table here. Again it's about a roll that is compared with the tactical rating of the tactical cohesion rating of the unit. And I like the fact that it's not just a pass or fail but depending on the level of success or sort of fail different things may happen for you and so um, and different levels of retreat may be assigned. It's also interesting that when there are losses to be assigned uh, in an assault the owning player can decide how to assign them. You can choose to um, pretty much fulfill the requirement of those losses by retreating or by taking morale hits or by taking casualty hits with the exception that sometimes there's a little asterisk there that reminds you that at least some of those hits will need to be taken as as casualties as casualties otherwise you'll always you would always be retreating and sometimes you know you need people to uh, take a casualty so this is pretty much the general idea fire combat step movement step i guess i forgot that one but you figured it out you move up to the movement allowance of your units based on the on the terrain that they are crossing in or entering. So after we um, we check command, we have fire, uh, fire combat, movement, assault, then units that are not in top shape maybe try to rally. Then we activate units that are on command and that is how we uh, end the activation of a unit. Once we do that, we draw the next chit. Oh, we drew them all already. I guess I just dumped them from the cup. Uh, we draw the next chit and we continue like this. Activation after activation, random event after random event until the end of the scenario. And then we determine victory, which can be based on different factors, mainly on control of specific access on the map. I like this game 
a lot. It is a very fine war game. It is the kind of war game that I want to play when I play a war game. It has historical detail, it has subtlety, it has tactical richness, it has variety, uh, which is interesting when you have a single map, but the two battles are different from one another. The scenarios um, look into those events from different uh, perspectives, so that also adds more variety. Really fun game. Not a game for beginners I believe because there is quite a bit that you have to take into account a, a game better enjoyed maybe by seasoned slash intermediate war gamers not hardcore but when you have to take into account uh, uh, differential and combat odds and a couple of other uh, shifts every time that you declare an assault the, the, there is there is that there is that to be taken in, to take into account plus a lot of other things uh, but if you're willing to put in some work to learn uh, to learn the rules and really becoming familiar with them and really being able to uh, play according to them, not just procedurally, but you see the rules, you see what you're supposed to do and you turn that into an advantage or into a series of challenges. How can I bring my units there without losing command? Um, efficiency for example when you if you put in that work then definitely this is a design that's totally worth it because you have a lot of interesting challenges again from from the command the decision of the posture which will affect the range in many cases it affects what you can do then how to maneuver the units and this you know this is something that we know we know we've seen we're gaming maneuvering setting up an attack but still there are a lot of things that you have to take into account the non-symmetrical um, uh, traits of the units of the two sides for example adds a lot the oppressions are tough and driven but they need to get past the wall of fire that the French rifles can produce but if the Prussians take advantage of their superior artilleries so they soften up the enemies a little bit and then they charge in then you can have some very interesting situations uh, also well of course you have to take into account stuff you know reactive fire terrain defenses etc etc it's almost like each side has a superiority in certain aspects that is then counterbalanced by some problem related to it like here well the pressures are stronger in assault but there is there is a rifle so rifle fire that they have to deal with and there are defenses that the french player may have prepared um the two sides play quite differently for one another and I would say that probably the Prussian side is the more fun to play if nothing else because because in the main scenario the Russian player gets to activate more often um, as opposed to the French player that again to simulate the inertia the malaise of the French commanders they don't get to activate as often they don't have as many chits in the cup so my impression is that the Prussian side is the, is more fun, more interesting to play. Not that I had that problem when I played the game because I played in solitaire. I played um, I played the scenarios in solitaire, playing both sides at the best of my possibilities, and it worked perfectly, uh, precisely because you have all of these levels of randomness, which are in the design to represent the fog of war, friction all of those other uh, things in war that you cannot control but also uh, make the the progression of the game one that uh, there will be full of surprises so if you're playing both sides you don't know what which side is going to go next who is going to go uh, in etc etc a lot of interesting challenges now there are a couple of things in the standard game if you're playing it to players that uh, that are supposed to be secret uh, very easy the adjustment is super easy randomize them for example each turn you select a chit and then the other ones are random guess what if you're playing both sides put them all in randomly without looking with these kind of like very simple adjustments adding just a little extra randomness i didn't have any problem i had i had scenarios that i was really engaging or engaging to engage with and I can't I can't think of the preposition because I'm thinking about the fire of the artillery the clouds of smoke the, the columns that are advancing trying to launch a charge of the bayonet as the as the light brigade you know that's another one as the light cavalry attacks from another direction so there were very interesting very intense situations that I love to explore I really 
got to the point like I want to see what happens next. So really engaging, really great system that combines uh, uh, tight, uh, complex, yes, but but very tight, very well well oiled, well, well organic, well working mechanics with a very strong theme. And so again, you have that extra layer of complexity in the rules yet, but it's totally worth it because then you really get to appreciate the theme, the challenges, it feels very historical, there's a lot of flavor there. Recently they complain about some not historical games that had a lot of complexity and I thought, and I thought why I'm not learning anything because that's a completely made up topic. Here you have a topic that you really get the sense that you get to understand and appreciate better if again you put in the work and and then you're willing to turn those those rules into procedures, those procedures into tactics and that tactics will result in, in an understanding and appreciation of historical events. On top, of course, again, of resulting in very, I wouldn't say cinematic sequences, because the setup as you are maneuvering around the uh, to, to approach the enemy, it doesn't have that fast pace, but there is that sense of slow progression that really builds up tension, and when then you get the assault, you get the carry charge, you get, um, you get the cannonade, all of those really pay off. So I really enjoyed the game, I recommend it to anywhere gamer, maybe not to the beginners, unless they're willing to put in some, some extra work even compared to the uh, seasoned intermediate war gamer. But you know, try the games, keep this one for you know, after a year that you play war gaming, maybe something like that. Um, but any war game that is willing to, uh, to learn the rules, an intermediate war gamer, an advanced war gamer, of course, highly recommend this game. There aren't many games about this topic, and that alone makes it interesting to me. On top of this, it's not just like, well, the game is kind of like, meh, but at least we learned about the topic. We get to explore a topic that we don't see very often in war gaming, and we do it in an absolutely fine, really really well uh, well fine-tuned a system with a system of rules that will result in very engaging very interesting gameplay at any cost Mets 1870 definitely highly recommended war game